way it goes down Where you hear about the sports all around town In the country All the controversy to the highlights You just not safe in the line all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of The Stoop where you can walk up and sit down. We're going to have a great conversation. The Stoop is hoops, hoops, and more hoops presented to you and powered by Nuts and Bowls Sports. Shout out to my man, Kev P. What's going on, Kev? Everything is everything, man. How y'all doing out there? All right, all right. Listen, we got another, another, another knockout interview, a special guest, man. Listen, coming from the Philadelphia area, uh, a friend central alumni, went on to some great things at the University of Penn Wharton School. He's been in the athletic family since day one. He got some specialty sports that we're going to talk about and get into. He's also a twin and right now a current manager at Rock Sports. He's a manager there. Ladies and gentlemen, put your uh, hands together for Mr. Rome Allen. Rome Allen, thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. So, Rome, man, at uh, what age did you specifically fall in love with sports, man? Yeah. um, So, I would say at one point in my life, I did a program with a bunch of people who like sports and I was there and everybody kind of had their specific reason. And I just like, I don't even know where to start. Right. So uh, I think first and foremost, um, so a lot of people know about my dad just cause same name, you know, he's a former player coach right now, but um, the first basketball coach I ever admired in my life was my mom. Um, so she was a, a teacher at Roberts Vox middle school, a substitute teacher. Um, she's now a superintendent. So she's climbed the ladder, the, the ranks from then till now. And she was the first person to really teach me, you know, that, that moniker that, you know, teachers say, you know, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, she showed me that every day. She'd be in her classroom braiding girls' hair. She'd be on the court coaching the boys' basketball team. Like, in, in every way, she <laughs> gave so much of herself to give back starting there with that Roberts Vox middle school basketball team. I remember being in a gym in North Philly, kicking on the radiators um, and, and watching those guys play. So it, it really, it, it starts there. Um, my mom it, I said basketball is big in her life. My stepdad, he played college basketball. My dad, basketball and sports have always been big. So I, I would say when I fell in love with sports though, it's definitely when I started playing for the Northwest Raiders. Um, that was my youth Pop Warner team. I played football, basketball, baseball, um, all up there on Sheldon Arley in Uptown. So that was really kind of my, my, my first experience with a team and, and, and really like real practicing. I know you play a little YMCA and you play little stuff here and there, but that was like, you know, we, we, we're trying to win. We're trying to do something. We want to see y'all grow. Um, and just that the friends I made there and, and the memories I had from my time playing for the Raiders, that's when I really knew that sports as a whole is, is, is what I love to do. Hey, hey Rome, this is a side note, bro. This is crazy. I know what Vox is, because it's right there on Temple's camp. I used to volunteer there like my freshman year, so it's crazy, man, how everything is just at six degrees is wild. I was like, wow, he said Vox, it's, it's been a while. But yeah, I know what Vox is, definitely, right there on campus, man. Um, listen, you like you mentioned, you're coming from a basketball family, but there's two loves that you have in terms of baseball and soccer. When did that really transpire for you, man? Got you, so I guess I'll jump right back to that point about the Raiders. So for me, like I said, my dad was a basketball player, right? We got the same name. If I ain't had a beard, we looked just alike. Yeah. Um, so in a lot of ways, a basketball, anybody know like anybody know me in basketball has never really been like my forte, but mostly just because, A, I didn't have to play basketball. A lot of guys, you know, as, as we all know, have to make a life out of the sport for themselves to make a better life for their family. When basketball was introduced to me by my father, it was – I played basketball, so you didn't have to. Those are the words that I heard, right? So basketball was just a hobby. I was just kind of out there, right, at times. And it wasn't that I wasn't an athlete or didn't love sports. I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to find myself. I'm not going to be able to, to, to make I'm – not, I'm not going to the league. I'm like, from a kid, I'm like, y'all think this is easy. But it's, I spent those summers on the track at 5 in the morning. I spent those long hours in the gym. I'm like, this – y'all got – like, this, this is difficult. Y'all got that. It's not for me. So – when I was playing with the Raiders and I found out that there was a baseball team, my dad also played football in high school too. And football was never for me. I mean, I was an offensive lineman. I liked playing football. The, the, the contact craziness, I was like, this is a little much for me. But when I, when we had the baseball season started eight and under and I got on the field and, you know, I had long arms, I'm a big kid. I'm, I'm throwing the ball around. I'm crushing baseballs at the plate. And I'm like, Oh yeah, this is, this is mine. Like, nobody can take this from me. This is not, there's no other 
connotations. There's no expectations to live up to or live down to. And, and in a lot of ways, basketball, my dad, he didn't, we didn't care. Like, he said, basketball, I'd rather you be a good person, right? My parents didn't. Sports wasn't always going to have to be my thing. So we would chuckle amongst ourselves about me and basketball because we knew it wasn't that deep. Other people would be like, oh, you got handles like you pop? I'm like, no, I play baseball. I play soccer. Like, that's that's my lane, right? And when I'm in that lane, I'm crushing that lane. So it wasn't just baseball and, and soccer, but I tried every sport that I could. Me and my, I can, I've never beat my dad in one-on-one, never have gotten to that point. But you mm-hmm. go to the tennis courts, I was trying to kill that man. I mean, <laughs> as a kid, like, me, I still can't serve to this day because neither one of us could serve. But, oh, I wanted to be incredible at tennis. I wanted to go play baseball, strike him out on the field. Like, everything else was mine. I let the basketball be kind of, like I said, my stepdad, he played college basketball. My mom, she loved basketball. You know, it was a big thing. But I was really about finding my own path, and that's what sports really pushed me to. Okay. Okay, so you, you mentioned that your mom was big in basketball, and obviously we know your dad and everything. And you wanted to play baseball, soccer, tennis even, basically try to make a name for yourself. But I did a little bit of research here, and I uncovered the nickname Pooh. Mm-hmm. Was that sports related? How did that come about? And is that still something that's prevalent? No, I mean, every, I mean, if you, if you know me, like from my family or even in the basketball world, you probably know me as Pooh. Um, when I was a little kid, my dad's name was his nickname was Pooh, so mine was Pooh Pooh. Then I ran like <laughs> they ran like thirteen. I was like, I kind of got to drop drop one of those at least. Um, so yeah, so my, my whole family, my sister, my mom, everybody calls him Pooh. Um, like I said, anybody, anybody used to play for my dad back around when I, anybody who's seen me around in the gym, just has kind of known me as Lil Poop, right? Just, like I said, around, rebounding, just kind of observing. So that name has definitely stuck with me. Um, some of my friends still even call me to, to this day. I don't introduce myself as Poop, but I'm like, if you know me, I, I'm Poop, right? So like I said, it's, it's a little confusing when me and my dad both have the same nickname at times, but I'm used to that in general, right? Got you. So everybody knows that, you know, you, you came from Friends Central. Um, the talented programs that they have there, athletic-wise, people really know that. You're coming from, you know, the Delaware Valley, the Philadelphia area, um, surrounding areas. Mm-hmm. Playing sports for you, more so about probably baseball would be better. When was that breakout moment that you had when you know that that was going to be special? Breakout moment, breakout game? Talk about that for a second. For sure. I, I, I never, I would never forget this game, I hope hopefully to my last day, um, freshman year, uh, soccer team. So freshman year fall, first varsity team. You know, I was going off the basketball team and baseball team after that, but freshman year soccer team. Um, that year, in no exaggerated sense, I was the worst player in the league. We finished bottom of the table, and I was by far the worst player on the team. So I was playing center back, which is like middle defensive person for the junior varsity team, but I also played goalie. So the varsity goalie got hurt midway through, so I kept getting called up a little bit here and there. He wasn't that great, so they kind of figured, you know, toss me in. Um, my first varsity start ever was against Harriman High School. So mind you, I started playing soccer in sixth grade because they was all right. Everybody else do the mile test, the goalies do goalie tryouts. And I'm like, cool, you got me. Um, so I, you know, didn't have to run. So that was a, a really uh, the first big push. But by the time I got to high school, at that point, I'm going I'm to send you a picture. I'm going I'm to try to find it. Send you a picture of my middle school soccer team. And you just kind of see how looming I am over everybody else. So it was easy to be a big, scary black kid out there, right? But high school, <laughs> like, like, it's a little different. Like, they, they they play. These guys train. You got some seniors about to go off to college. Like, yeah. it got real. So I, I was nowhere near where I needed to be in terms of skill set. Didn't know anything about the game. Barely know the rules. I was just kind of had been out there. So I, I get my first start against Harrington High School. Um, a really historically good soccer program, public school right up the street, and I'm I'm ready to shit myself. <laughs> like I'm 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 scared beyond belief. I play I got subbed into a couple games from before, but never my first start. So I lived down the street from Front Central. We moved from North Philly when I was in eighth grade. So I used to live at Thirty Second Allegheny. Then we live right at like City Line Haverford. So two hours before the game, I'm there. I'm the only one on the field. Um, like I said, no clue what I'm doing, but I'm just making up solo drills to do on my own, right? Just diving after the ball here and there, thinking about my steps, my cadence, and 
And like I said, that that game changed everything. Like I said, my first varsity start, we playing against a really great team. Uh, I'm, I'm a freshman. I'm out there. I don't know what's going on, but lo and behold, we won the game two nothing. Right, uh, huge upset on our part. That was that was our at the end of the season. Everybody was the highlight of the season. It was being here, and that game has stuck with me throughout my not just my sporting career, but just my life. As you know, if you want to if you want to excel at something, if you want to be great at something, you got to prepare, and not just prepare. Sometimes you got to be the only person out there. You got to show up two hours before to get it right. That game, I think more so than anything, less physically of what I was capable of, or I didn't really have the skills, or wasn't really training, but I got locked in two hours before the game started. I was the first person out there, just me. And so that taught, and I've used that game as evidence to, you gotta show up early, you gotta put the work in early, you gotta be prepared. And my whole soccer career is emblematic of mentally, kind of the approach I tell people I, I bring to life. It's, it's a goalkeeping mindset. My freshman year, if you, I was, I'm scared. I'm like, I'm hoping the ball stays as far away from me as possible. You can't play goalie like that, right? Like, yeah. you got to, you got to, you got to want to go after it. Yeah, if, if you if you thinking it's going, they're going to come, they're going to score on you, or like I said, every every everything visualizing that success. You visualizing failure, you won't get failure. If I'm scared, I'm going to be scared. So that that year, like I said, I was real rough. <laughs> we ended at the bottom of the table. Sophomore year, I come back, wasn't really playing. I was trying to get more serious about baseball because you know that's that's right when everybody just started specializing like everybody had just went their separate ways I'm like maybe should I cut it down a little bit I don't know ended up quitting the soccer team that went through the season I was failing in French class I'm like let me just go focus on basketball get in the gym mind you like our our French basketball team we that was the year we won our fourth straight state championship so I'm like I'm trying to be a part of that team maybe a little bit um uh, try to get on the court so I'll be the team Basically, my best friend is to, one of my best friends to this day. Co-captains of the, of the soccer team. Um, he convinced me to come back my junior year. Him and the coach were like, "We need a goalie. Need you back, whatever." Um, and the biggest change was not even my skill set or what I learned of how to play. It was about my mentality. Right? I couldn't be scared no more. You can't. You can't wish adversity away. Adversity doesn't tell you when it's coming. It doesn't wait for you to be ready. As a goalie, you might get two shots a game. You might get 20. You might get one shot every 20 minutes. You might get one shot every two minutes. But you've got to be prepared for that adversity. You've got to be ready for it to come, and you got to walk into it, like I said, mind ready. I want, to ask, I want to ask you this because you talked about the mental preparation for it and being prepared for the moment and, and, and doing everything you needed to do just to be there and, and be ready. Um, that's one aspect of it. And I also know that coming into your family and everything with basketball, we know that it's a game of footwork and eye coordination where they're both equally important. Soccer, more so the footwork. And baseball, obviously, hand-eye coordination is really uh, a, an element of it that's important. But would you say that your early exposure to basketball helped you to develop some of the skills to excel at both baseball and soccer? Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. I think just... I mean, basketball is, is a, a fair amount of hand-eye coordination and a lot of really core and body control, right? Stop and start and cut and crossing over. And those type of elements, those type of actions persist in all sports, right? The way I play defense, I'm breaking down at the top of the key, right? That's almost the same way I play goalie. I'm shielding the basket. I'm shielding the goal. I'm, I'm turning on that angle. I'm quick, choppy steps. I got to move and get set, have my feet up under me. Same kind of cadence as you, you want to move around the soccer field I mean, even a, a, as field players too right you want to that that act of shielding some of those things are translatable definitely even soccer and baseball right hand-eye coordination I didn't realize how good I, I was at goalie until I went to South Africa and played a, a long time but I'm like I'm looking at guys kick the ball and I'm like I'm reading it off of his foot just like I read a curveball out of a pitcher's hand I'm like mm. slow slow to slow the ball down to your game baseball they teach you Throw your hands at the ball. What I'm doing is in goalie. Throw my hands at the ball to keep it out, right? Um, so I've definitely seen synergies across really all sports. I think uh, I mean, we live in this era of specialization. Um, I think a lot of people should really just look at science and what it says, especially about youth sports. I think all youth athletes should be playing as many sports as possible. Um, like I said, that I, you know, I played – we had one season of lacrosse in middle school. I'm like, you know what, let me try that just to get that experience. I played – 
imagine kid, I'm getting off the school bus with a six foot long lacrosse stick in the middle of North Philly in seventh grade every day, right? Like looking crazy, throwing the ball, like with this deep hole, throwing the ball against the wall. But I just wanted to get that experience and that absolutely not just with basketball, not just with soccer or baseball, but everything you kind of touch and try, you can kind of apply that coordination, apply that skill set, apply that muscle memory in other places. Cool. Now, we know, obviously, about the athletics in your home, as we just spoke about at length. Um, but there was also an emphasis on education, as both you and your twin sister, Taylor, attended the prestigious UPenn. Um, tell us about that upbringing and its culmination as you and Taylor shared a graduation, as well as do you think being exposed to basketball and the business of basketball is what influenced you to go there? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, definitely, I had my hard mindset on Penn for a while, just growing up around there, growing up around campus. Um, me and my sister, we're, we're both very, very close twins. Um, definitely a connection that's hard to describe in a lot of ways. Uh, we didn't, we weren't set on going to school together. We both were like, if we go to school together, it's going to be a Penn together. So luckily, that, that worked out. Um, and like I said, education come first. Like I said, first thing my dad told me, I play basketball, so you didn't have to. My mom, she was an educator. She was a teacher. She was raising twins while working on her masters, while wow. raising other people, while raising other people's children. Like we, I, as a kid, I didn't even realize what was going on. She like, oh, yeah, I got a new babysitter, and this girl's living with us for months at a time, right? And it's not just the value of education or the value of sports. It's about what those things can do for you, right? How that can push your life forward. That's what we really saw. Not just like I said, it was always written in the cards for us that we was going to college. I think I had this conversation with my mom yesterday or two days ago, and she was like, no, me as a first generation low income student, I didn't know a lot about, you know, college or applying or what you could and couldn't do. Um, but I'm, I made sure that that was the norm for you and your sister, that you guys saw achievement, went to graduations, went to all that. And I was like, all that even aside, right? Like seeing how much she put into her middle school graduations to really show them how big it was. My, my grandmother, um, I'm not gonna tell you how old she is to date her, but Basically, you know, she raised my mom by herself for the most part, put her through school. Once my mom got out of college, she was just like, oh, this is something that I should do. So me and my little sister were growing up. My grandma actually went back to school, went to Temple. So as a little kid, me and my, little, my twin sister, we'd be in the Temple library till 2 a.m. helping her do homeworks and projects and stuff like that. And she would be like, listen, like, I'm getting my degree before y'all get y'all. She would be, once, once she saw, once we, once we got into school, and she was, I saw the value of education through my mom. She didn't want the world to think she was no dummy or wasn't capable, wasn't nothing. It took her a while, like almost a decade. She was like, but I'm a finish. Um, so I think, like I said, not just the things that we saw, but the people in our lives, those family members, it was just, like I said, education written in the cards for us. She telling us at seven, eight, I'm finishing my degree before y'all get jobs. She like, I know I got about 15 years or so, so I'm gonna get mine before y'all get y'all. So those lessons were always in us. Nice. Well, while at Penn, you were active with McCoo. And for those who don't know, that's a Black cultural center that provides uh, academic, cultural, and social support to students. Explain to us uh, the significance of having a program like that, as well as the resources that it provides. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, first and foremost, I need to say, like, I think in a lot of ways, all universities offer services and have spaces and for students to use. And oftentimes, they don't. And I was one of those students as well, right? Like, I, it took me a while to find my way back into that space um, and to use it effectively. Um, so Brian Peterson, who is, shout out to him, the greatest, uh, he's kind of supports, he, he runs my crew at Black Culture Center, but just in general supports the Black community at Penn. So he's been a, a great help to, to, to me and, and countless others. So I just, one, want to give him his props, but then two, just, you know, like I said, providing that space for us to be together, I was very involved in Black Men United, which is the kind of black male undergraduate group. We did monthly meetings and dinners, et cetera. So just having that space together, um, just knowing it's there, whether, like I said, whether you are using it or not, you know, being knowledgeable about it enough to know when you need to come home and, and be a part of that. So can't really speak enough about how important Brian and, and everyone who works in the center has been to the entire Plank community. That's great. That's dope. That's dope. Well, Wharton's a uh, prominent alumni can be found in the medical field, business, athletics, and name a few. Um, but there's apparently a gap that needed to be bridged between business and the sports field. And you are the co-founder of the Wharton, Wharton Sports Business Summit. 
what can you tell about its development and your current involvement? Yes, so I am, I guess we call it like an alumni advisory board now, just for the, uh, the current Students Planning Summit. But, so I mean, this the summit planning, I wanna say it started second semester of junior year of college, and then we put it on that this is my senior fall. Um, but in reality, the planning started years ago. So when we talk about, you know, success, and we talk about, sorry, I'm just like a computer real quick. But um, when we talk about success, we talk about access to, to resources and things that people can use. Um, people usually kind of get up and say, oh, you know, I did it all by myself, or, you know, it was, it was just me and, and nobody else. Like, one, I don't even know what loneliness feels like, because I got a twin, like, I, like, there's a privilege and a blessing to, to experience that, but I would never get up here and say, like, you know, we, we just put it together from the muscle. So me and my roommate at the time, uh, his name is Jared. He currently works in uh, baseball operations for the New York Mets. But we met at a summer program in high school called the Warren Sports Business, Sports Business Academy. So that was 2013. And that was right before the cell phone boom, per se. So the knowledge and the expertise and stuff that we brought brought to putting together that summit started the seed was planted back then we just didn't put it into fruition until 2017 um, we were kind of just like you know what uh, too many people here in at, whether it be Warren or just Penn in general think that they have to go into financial consulting or we have to go into these rigid structures and uh, my first and foremost my goal was just to prove to people that you know you can do something you love you can work in a field that that you love doing that you um that you will wake up every day and, and appreciate. And it's not just about what people think you should, should do. So put together the summit, had a career fair aspect to it, had a bunch of different diverse um, kind of speakers and, and topics, and was really, really proud of the the fruits of it, especially in its first iteration. So this year, you know, it's not going to happen just, you know, with coronavirus, everything going on. So we're working on a few online programs, but th this all time has also helped me kind of get back reinvested in the summit, which has been nice. Um, We've been putting on a couple of different speaker series. I spoke with um, Renee Montgomery uh, a few weeks ago about, um, you know, not just opting out of her WNBA, you know, return, but just what her plan was and what she was trying to work on moving forward. So a lot of good stuff is going with that. I'm looking forward to seeing the growth. Um, and just as a leader, it was really important to put the right people in place and they're going to make that successful in the future. Got it. Listen, man, I'm going to add a quick two-part question uh, for you, if, if you don't mind. So you already spoke about Africa, and we know that your father played internationally as well as in, in domestically in the league. Um, when you had the opportunity, and this is another side note, um, Kev, uh, Rome has uh, always has been in the know about everything because he, uh, he spoke about uh, knowing Ty Grant and his Ty Grant story from uh, way back in the day as well. And I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I don't know if people want to share that, but that's up to him. But anyway, let me get back. Um, yeah. Traveling international Rome, like what was this, in terms of sports and what you saw, what were some of the culture shocks that you witnessed? And the second part is also because your father played internationally, what sticks out to you in terms of a player that you watched playing and saying, yo, he's super nice, but didn't probably get an NBA look, but it was overseas and he was doing his thing. So that's my two part question. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll say one, just sports aside. So, I mean, like I said, we lived, me, my mom, my sister, my stepdad lived in 32nd Allegheny, right there, middle of North Philly. Um, loved it. You know, it, it, it was, you know, a place that's very special to us. I got the, that, that the address of that house tattooed on my left arm, right? And my twin sister has one on, uh, on her as well. So, that time was so important to us, and it wasn't just because of that place, but the fact that I could go from that reality, North Philly, and I wake up 12 hours later, and I'm walking through the ruins of Pompeii, it, the, the contrast, the, the exposure to to be in a poppy store, buying sunflower seeds, to eating like authentic thin crust Italian pizza on the Mediterranean coast, like that that like that shaped my worldview in a way that I really am just starting to understand. Right? You don't like I said we went to Italy like eleven times between the time I was six and like 14 or something like something like that crazy we go every winter break and every summer but the first culture shock I remember so my favorite out of all the places and cities my dad lived in my favorite place is Naples um he used to live in what's called Lago de Verno in, in Roman and Greek mythology Lago de Verno was considered the entrance to Hades because it used to have like these steam bubbles coming up that would kill birds around it 
So it's real kind of old deactivated volcano on the coast of the Tyranian Sea overlooking Capri from the inside of the volcano. Lived on a villa with a lake and orchard. And so, like I said, we on the block playing tag, me and my sister, and then we running through the villa picking grapes and, and, and lemons and, and watching the sunset over the sea. And like I said, so that contrast really pushed me off. But in regards to the sports in Naples, um, like I said, I didn't, I didn't really get educated about their fans until now. But I remember the next – we land, the next day you got a game. We walking in the stadium, I was always the ball boy. When me and my sister were just there, the two of us, she was sent behind the bench and I was sitting behind the basket um, to, sweep, to sweep up before games. So I remember we, – we, and me and my sister just talked about this. Like, we walk into the stadium and we look up and I'm like, why they got plexiglass sections in the stands to keep the fans separated, right? So I'm like, walk in perplexed. Yeah. Game time start, next thing you know, they got flares in. I mean, it's like a ten. That's like a ten thousand seater. Flares, signs going crazy. Like, I, and I, and I, I at this point, I've been a fair amount of games before. I'm like, this passion, is is different. It's next and, and, and it, it, it is, and it, and it is, it's very different. And you could, like I said, I'm like, I got plexiglass. Then the game time start, and I'm like, oh, they they getting it in. Um, so, like I said, it, that has really pushed me to up until this point investigate why are they so passionate about it? Why do they care so much? Why do when I pull up when we pull up to the stadium, we look at the basketball gym, it's a little 10,000, 20,000 seater. I'm like, the soccer stadium look like make this look like a shoebox, <laughs> and it's in the same parking lot. So, um, like I said, th- those type of things set me on the course then to figure all that out, um, is what it really exposed me to. Okay, and somebody who was nice playing over there that didn't get an NBA look, but got gotcha. okay. you. Yeah, go ahead. Got gotcha. um, Yeah, I mean, I got a lot, a lot of perspectives on that just from like my stance in the business now. I think it's interesting. Too often times, the media or the public will look at athletes and be like, you know, that guy didn't get it done. That guy got in a bad situation and couldn't do whatever. Um, and the opportunity, it just showed me the importance of opportunity, right? Some guys that's really, really talented, just a scout never probably came across them, right? I mean, in my, I don't really remember, like, oh, that person stuck out as somebody who made it, could have played over here or whatever, or like an Italian seven-footer kind of hiding away. But not that I saw that person, but that I know that they're there, right? So really just the importance of the opportunity. You don't know who's going to cross, come across you when. That's why you always just kind of got to be ready. And for athletes, just always prepared, always say, you never know who's watching because I've been around in a lot of places watching a lot of people and now I'm I'm here and in and, and a stance where I can make an impact and I'm like, I know who not to mess with, who not to, who to mess with. So uh, what's, what's stuck to me uh, out about guys, that's more of a um, more like when I was on the road out watching guys, watching guys play, talking through, you know, different guys' skill sets and, and, and really – to me, what I'm always watching for, what I was watching for as a kid, what I was watching for high school, and now is just really just the guy's attitude, his body language, um, his approach to the game. That, that to me, more paramount than everything because everything else you can learn, um, regardless of who you are and where your skill set is. So what type of team manager you want to be is, is, is the investigation I was coming with. Okay. Now, um, it's coming up on about a month and a half since the untimely demise and, and death of Mr. George Floyd. Um, knowing that you're advising and um, supporting many different athletes all across uh, so many different sports and spectrums. What advice have you given them to utilize uh, the potential platform and given the particular, excuse me, the potential climate that exists right now? Um, and how has that, you know, kind of shaped some of your guys and, and ladies that you work with and also your perspective as well, if you don't mind? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think – I'll take a deep breath first because this is a stressful conversation for all of us, right? Like this kind of make your blood boil a little bit. So I want to, I want to acknowledge that, um, to acknowledge that I'm a person. I always try to find the right words, but in reality, I'm trying to process something that none of us should be processing. So the fact that, you know, we all still thinking about it, still trying to figure out what's going on, that's going to happen. Um, and in terms of advising athletes and with the platform, and I spoke at length with this about, uh, about this with Renee Montgomery is just, you know, we all have a role to play. Um, I think a lot of people, whether it be white, black, whoever, in the country or just in the world conversation now is realizing that I can't do nothing. Um, 
so I, I, I've been encouraging guys to except figure out which way you can make that impact. Not every guy wants to be vocal, right, or, or use their platform, just in general, not necessarily on social causes. So if your lane is getting on the court and doing as best as possible as you can in the court while wearing a Black Lives Matter armband, let that be your lane, right? Some people's lanes are protesting. Some people's lane is protest music. And we need protesters. We need protest music. We need people handing out, you know, water and, and milk. When people get tear gas, we need, you know, people at home amplifying messages, hitting the retweet button, people signing petitions, right? So uh, same thing I've been telling normal people and as well as them, you know, what what is your lane? What what are you trying to do? Is it just donating? Is it, make, is it writing that check? It might be that, right? If that's how you can feel you, you can make an impact, but just don't don't be on the sidelines. That's 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 really what I kind of leave it at, to figure out where you might want to be. I'm still trying to figure out where I want to, what type of role I want to play in all this, but you got to come up off the bench and do something. Um, and it can be passive, it can be active, but something can be done. Thank right, you. Well, tell us about your current role at Rock Sports. What does any given day look like for you? And in addition to that, we also know that Rock Nation is, is known for its sports and business endeavors, but also for its cultural impact. Your sports and business focus at Wharton coupled with McCool's cultural and nurturing making that the ideal situation. How would you describe this seemingly uh, like perfect fit? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's exactly what it is. I think it was a perfect fit from the beginning. Uh, it kind of took a long way to, way to kind of have this be the opportunity that I'm gonna get. It's really, this is really my, I guess, technically my first job. All right, so tell us about your current situation at Rock Sports and what an average day looks like for you, because we know Rock Nation is known not only for its sports and business endeavors, but also for its cultural impact. Your sports and business focus at Wharton coupled with McCoo's cultural nurturing makes this the ideal situation. How would you describe what seems to be the perfect fit? Yeah, no, it's definitely been a, been a great fit. I've um, been loving it so far. I joined in October. Uh, I would say first just on kind of like the, the mutual interest for me, the fact that this company is global, international. Um, we have a London office, um, we, we have, you know, Athletes from the African continent, um, trying to you know grow our international it's just a space in general. So the fact that it's beyond football and basketball and baseball uh, is what really is enticing to me. Well, on an average day, I think the one thing I love about my industry and just kind of my position and managing you know, my players and just kind of everything going on in the office is that no no one day is the same. Uh, it all is kind of different. What I've been telling people and some of my advice is to just try to diversify your skill set because one day I could be helping with, you know, planning a community event. One day I could be, you know, watching film and kind of, you know, evaluating what somebody might need to be working on or if they had a bad game or not. Um, one day I'm, you know, just a kind of a counselor or a friend, just like, you know, somebody with, you know, got to have some emotional intelligence to kind of support people as they, you know, go through some of these things. So the fact that, you know, I can do so many different things, it really is very customer centric, right? Built around the individual a client, the individual athlete, what they want out of the experience, what they're looking for. Um, and those things just, you know, really, really range, you know, a lot of time spent, you know, on my phone, on Twitter and on Instagram, because that's where a lot of the business is done. Um, I usually come in, I make sure I open oh, we're in the office, but just kind of scour through sports business journal, ESPN, Bleacher Report, and make sure I'm up to date with just where the industry is. And then like I said, they might take a turn for, you know, whatever direction, but mostly right now I'm studying. So I'm, I'm planning on being an NBA agent. Uh, so I'm t I want to take the exam in January 21. So I've just been doing a lot of studying for that and just general prep and planning around, you know, what playing that role might look like. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is either future planning or just kind of day to day. Um, this is what needs to get done. And then can, can you give me the second part to that question again? I just, um, I just oh, want to know the, the cultural fit, the cultural fit. Yeah. Um, yeah, can't appreciate that enough, honestly. So, I mean, I've – this is my first full-time job. You know, I, I did a fellowship in South Africa. I've had a couple of internships before. I worked for various different companies throughout, you know, a couple of months while at Penn. But um, it's just, you know, the, the space to feel free, the space to feel like, you know, just be yourself, regardless of who you are. You know, we have a very diverse company. So – you're bringing in whatever cultural competency you have because, you know, we service athletes from different countries, different backgrounds. So just to kind of get this mix and it's, and it's in an open environment, uh, an environment where 
like I said, I feel comfortable, you know, speaking about some of these things, speaking about these difficult topics, because these are some of the things that, you know, we work on at times. Um, so, yeah, I've been enjoying myself for sure. If I can, Kev, real quick, I want to interject. Um, mm -hmm. Rome, I have a quick question in terms of we're talking about culture. So when you pull up to the stoop, it's about cultures, about what's going on in the streets. What does the thing about the word rock and Rockefeller and rock nation, has that stuck out to you? Do you ever step back and say, yo, I'm a part of a, a, a iconic thing, an iconic label that started back in, you know, 96 when, you know, we talking about rap and hip hop. And then you bridge that with the athletes and we know how much athletes, sports, hip hop and rap all immersed in the culture. Uh, talk about that. And I got a, I got a real history question because my man, Adam, yeah. asked this. Yo, when y'all yeah. sign on, y'all get a Rockefeller chain, man. I just, I'm just curious. Man. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it, working on it. Like, no. But, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, except my, my parents, they, you know, grew up in the nineties and through that whole music era and, yeah. you know, what my mom put on from what my mom put on when she cleaning and on, on the weekends to when she, you know, just kind of jamming out hip hop music and, and, and my, they're both of them, my, my, my stepdad to my mom to my dad, like just their love of just that, that whole era that, that Jay was emblematic of, right? That era from R&B to, to, to rap and everything in between. So I, I grew up going to a lot of concerts, fortunately, because I have a twin, you know, I always have somebody to, to go with, right? So my mom, she loved concerts, loved music. First concert I ever went to was like an Eve concert at the Dell when I was like like six or seven or something like that. But, you know, after that, never missed a powerhouse, never missed a meat concert, never missed a J. Cole concert in Philly. Every Made in America, we was there deep, right, every day. So that's, you know, going back to sophomore year of high school and long but fast forward now, you know, being in a building where, you know, I can make an impact on some of those things, you know, if, you know, if that were the case in the future that, you know, we work on some of those things and just to kind of hear about what's going on as I'm, I'm working in the sports side and to think about, you know, the artists that we have in the building, people who, you know, the music I'm listening to before my soccer games, you know, before baseball games, um, just that I've been in those concert halls, you know, put, throwing up the rock, right? Like bopping up and down, you know, the lights go on at the end of the concert and yeah. they pointing out people in the crowd. And so I've been in those spaces before. So I, again, it's, I feel like it's a, not just a blessing and a privilege to be here and to work here, but I feel responsible for what what this will represent in the future, what it represents now, um, and what it will represent past my own time. So that that's that's why I think not just to, you know to be here and be connected to the culture and a black company, et cetera, but just uh, I feel ownership in it. I feel a vested interest in it because I know how some of these voices in this building impacted me on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, what advantages does having a father that played professional basketball in your business background give you mm -hmm. dealing with clients? Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, I definitely, I, I would like to think I have a fairly good basketball IQ. Um, and it really just, just from daily conversations. I've always loved the game. Like I said, I never really wanted to play it seriously, but loved the game of basketball since I was a little kid. Um, so I've always just kind of been around those conversations, been around those practices, those film sessions, where I've, you know, been recruiting, I've helped break down film, I'm, you know, in the gym doing workouts, watching, you know, what to teach, what not to teach. Um, also had a lot of great coaches myself growing up. Um, my middle school basketball coach, Coach Falwell, he was phenomenal. Um, my high school basketball coach, uh, coaches Jason Polikoff and Ryan Tozer, like I said, we, we won four straight state championships, um, and I was on two of those teams. Um, I didn't play play that much, but like I said, I was I was there, and, and what I got to learn from, like I said, in, in the classroom, I would say the classroom as like my court at school at Friend Central um, versus, you know, some of my outside teams to kind of round it off my experience with all my parents and their knowledge and love of basketball. It really all helped put me in this position to really feel um, – capable in terms of like I say, just applying that knowledge, but also just, you know, the network. And like I said, you talk about Ty Grant. I was like, oh, I'm at the, one of those trips to Italy, one of those winners, I believe it was like 10 or 11. We had just gotten into Milan really late. And my dad was like, I want you to be my friend. Like, you know, I stop, meet Ty before we go drive a couple hours to the next city where he was staying at. So we, we me and my sister, we pull up in, uh, in like this kind of like nightclub lounges thing, like these little kids kind of walking around. Like, I was like, no, nah, I really just want y'all to meet Ty. I mean, 
I'll never forget me sitting there eating chicken salad sandwiches in some back room and all there is just God. Yo, hey, what's up, son? What's up, son? Son, so like going, <laughs> going back and back and forth. Um, it's, uh, you know, oh, like, I'm on this podcast and I hit, I called you. I'm like, I know Ty Grant. Like that's my old head. So we go, we go way back and it's it's, it's stories like that. Um, and I think it. I would like to believe it helps with some of my credibility. I just tell people like. I'm just a little poop. Like, you know, I've been, I'm just been a kid in the gym rebounding. Like I'm not, because again, this business is hard to find who to trust or why, or why they into it or what they doing it for. So most people like who can refer me like, like the Ty Grants of the world. I'm like, you know, me from 10 <laughs> year old in, in Milan, like it, it go, it go way deeper than this. Got it. So he know you from when you was poo poo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wrong. Wrong. Got to say thank you. It's been a great pleasure to sit down with you. We have one more question I want to close out with. So think about it from this perspective. Ten years from now, you sitting back in a chair and you exhale. Um, what would you tell, you know, the next Rome Allen coming along, man, who want to aspire to be in the shoes that you've been in? And, you know, you say you got aspirations to become an agent. But, you know, not only that, but, you know, working these big companies led by a major mogul and sets of moguls and people. Man, a cat that was – at 32nd or a cat that went to vaults. What, what, what do you say to them, man? What do you do to motivate them and help them get to the ranks of what, you, what you've seen, what you've done and, and inspired to? And then also, man, what do you see next for yourself as well? Yeah. Um, so I would say my advice to the people and just people trying to, you know, quote unquote, make it right. So it's just one, like I said, I don't, I don't ever want to for a second pretend like, like I said, be one of the, the rugged individualists who like, oh, it just kind of happened like that, right? So I know my, like, what's helping me where I am right now is my early exposure to basketball. I wanted to go to South Africa so bad because I knew what traveling the world and sports could do for you, even as a kid. So I was like, I know that's what I want to do next. So those type of influences, um, the type of agency, the fact that I've had my mom, she she was up in my school every day. Anything happened, any, she was out there to investigate to empower and make sure stuff was straight. So I don't want to discredit some of those advantages that I've, that I've certainly had. And like I said, always had companionship between a couple group projects, whatever it is. Um, but like I said, for, for, for everybody trying to make it, because like I said, it's only a limited amount of opportunities, limited amount of spots. Um, I just want you as a person to just put good energy out into the world. So I know we talk about kind of karma and what that means and that might mean something to different people, but just with anything in life, right? You put hard work in, you won't get what you deserve out of it. You won't get a championship. You won't get whatever. You got to put good energy out into the world. You got to put positivity out into the world. That's the only way you're going to get it in return, right? If I, if I call you, I'm like, no, be cool, be good. Like, you won't get that reciprocated. So that's kind of what everything you do. If you let positivity guide you, if you let, you know, self-sacrifice guide you in, in your actions, um, that's going to come back to you. And, and that's kind of what I'm realizing in this phase of my life now. It's not just those ways in which I was, I was blessed. It was the, the, the person that I've always tried to be. I really strive to like, you know, I don't talk down on people. I'm not cussing nobody out or calling nobody out. I'm like, I'm a really, really genuinely try my hardest to, 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 to treat others the way I want to be treated. Um, and, and I think that, I think that's going to come back to you. So again, just, you know, be prepared. Like I said, that goalkeeper mindset, you can't wish adversity away. Don't you can't sit back and just be like, oh, it's not gonna come or hope. Like you just gotta be ready. And sometimes you might wanna, I'm like, yeah, come on, I want some shots. I want some adversity. So being prepared and being just a good citizen to, to to those around you and the world around you, right? Um give me a second part of the question again. I'm, I'm just for me, where I see myself for ten years. Yeah, yourself, yeah. You know, looking back and you know, from where you've come from and where you wanna go, inspired to be still yourself. Yeah. Um I mean, I kind of, I'm like, I'm a little crazy sometimes too. Uh, I definitely like to plan things out years and years in advance. Like when I was in, when I was in eighth grade and this guy came back to our high school to present about the CTC 10 fellowship, right? Go to South Africa and play soccer with kids for a year. I went home that day. I was like, all right, mom, like, I'm going to go to Penn and I'm going to go to South Africa. And this was when I was 14. She was just like, all right, okay, we'll see. Like 24, I'm like, damn, like that was crazy. I'm like, I was really, you know, and I, I was, and in that moment, I was as determined as I was the day I, the day before I left. Like when he said you could do this, I was like, I'm, I'm doing it. Like it's no, it's no question. So that kind of burn the ships mentality, that kind of no turnaround mentality, 
I would I would encourage people to have that. But you talk about like I said diversifying your skill set. Have that about a couple of different things. Okay. Have that like you know have that I want to chase. I know, I'm gonna focus on this, but I also gotta love elsewhere, right? Don't put all your eggs in kind of one basket. I mean, you diversify your skill set you might get to put all that to use, right? Like, just like we talked about on the court and on the field, oh, you know, my soccer footwork is similar to my defensive footwork in basketball and, you know, my baseball, my hand-eye coordination, just like I'm, you know, in my crew and we, you know, kind of talk about, you know, black male mental health. I'm like, I'm working for a lot of stressed out black men and like, learn, like I, that, I need to not only apply that to what I'm doing, but I need to apply to, the knowledge I, I got from, you know, the FIBA courts in Italy, right? That all those things are now coming back into play. So you can be relentless in your pursuit of kind of, you know, the things that you love. And I say things, like I said, don't, it's too much, so much out here to, to appreciate and to love and to take in in the world. I just even got back into art, right? Like I'm, I used to do these things called continuous line drawing. I stopped doing them for years and now I'm doing them again, right? I just keep trying to add to my bag, add to my arsenal of, things I can really pour my heart into and feel invested into. Um, and, and that's really what I've been focused on is just continue to be a lifelong learner. 10 years from now, I know I'll be somewhere incredibly successful because at the end of the day, I feel as if this has always been in the cards for me. Um, Cause it, it didn't, it didn't just, and it's not just starting now. It started years ago. Um, this kind of, this process, this, 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 this build up to, you know, whoever I will be in the future. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of people, like I said, always had a, I'm the last thing to say, always had an underdog mentality. I've never been complacent. Um, I had a lot of friends, oh, you was at the brunch, you, you know, you made it. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I ain't done, I ain't done nothing yet. Right. And that's, and, that, and that's kind of how, how I always feel is that, you know, that next hill, that next mountain, I'm, I'm, I'm bulldozing through it and, 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 and just to find the next one. Right. So, I'm gonna keep climbing this ladder. Um, yeah, just keep learning about these experiences and, and everything happened to me and, and hopefully put them to good work. Solid, solid. Well, listen, um, Mr. Romala, we wanna thank you for all the jewels you dropped because you dropped a lot, bro. And um, we know you on some some great things and you destined for greatness, man. And just thank you for sharing um, all the things that's impacted you along your journey, man, and where you at with, 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 with rock sports and all the things that you go through and just being real supportive there, man. And we wish you all the continued success, man. And most importantly, we want to thank you for just coming by and sitting on the stoop for us for a little while, man. And we greatly appreciate your time today. Yeah, for sure. Thank y'all. Look forward to staying in contact. And remember, you, you, you my old head, all right? Don't, please don't call me sir or mr. or none, none of that. Um, I got you. You call me, you stop. Listen, listen. You, you, you could call me Pooh. Some say that it gets no real on the field or the court to capture the thrillers. Some opinions and all of the truth. Real people talking real sports on the stoop.